From the Toronto Star, I'm Rudji Mudler, and this matters. Now they say I'm immune, I feel so powerful, I'll walk into that audience. I'll walk in there, I'll kiss everyone in that audience. I'll kiss the guys and the beautiful women and everybody. I'll give you a big fat kiss. There are some who have accused the media of fear-mongering. And while I am no medical expert, I feel safe in warning you not to kiss the President of the United States right now. Wherever he might be in his battle with COVID-19, he has helped put the spotlight on recovery. And today, we are going to be talking about antibodies. In one of our earliest episodes, we talked with star reporter Mae Warren, who in March got ill with what she believed was COVID-19. Here she is describing her symptoms. Super sick. Low energy, I think, was the biggest thing. And I think it was because I wasn't getting like as much oxygen in my lungs. The muscle aches were pretty bad as well. And I had zero appetite. It's not like a cold. It's not like a flu. For me, at least, it was really like knocks you out for like several days. Thankfully, May recovered quickly and continued her excellent work. She just recently wrote about her experience getting a test for antibodies for the virus. So we were having her back on to bring us up to speed on how you can get a test, how they work, and what exactly antibodies are and what they mean. May, I want to thank you so much for once again appearing on This Matters. My pleasure. Happy to be here. Okay, I really want to get into the logistics about this and what antibodies and their tests might mean. But let's just start at the beginning. Why did you want to go get this test now? Well, as you know, and we talked about back in March, I was exposed to COVID-19. I had close contact with a friend who ended up testing positive. And then I started developing symptoms like fatigue and some shortness of breath, dry cough, things like that. So kind of classic symptoms of COVID. And I was contacted by Toronto Public Health as part of their contact tracing. And they said, because I was in close contact with someone who was tested and I had symptoms, I was what they call a probable case. So pretty much like you have it, but you know, you're not going to get tested because they just didn't have enough tests at that point. And they were only testing high risk groups like healthcare workers. And like my friend who was tested was a doctor, for example, or people who had traveled or people with, you know, risk factors or things like that. So they were just kind of like, okay, just stay in your apartment, isolate, get better, And they mark me down as probable, which is actually included in the Toronto Public Health case counts for the numbers daily, but not in the provincial ones. And yeah, so I happily recovered. I was pretty sick, but got better, back to normal. And at the beginning, I was like, well, I don't need the test. I know I had it. No big deal. But kind of as time went on, I kind of regretted not getting the test. There wasn't a doubt in my mind that I had it because I was pretty much the sickest I think I've ever been in my life. But just to not have that piece of paper to like prove it like say to a doctor down the road, if there was, God forbid, a long-term impact or something, it just would be nice to have that kind of confirmation. So that was a big reason why. And also I was just curious to kind of confirm to myself that it wasn't in my head and that I did have what I thought I had. As a reporter, that is something that would have driven me nuts. So I'm with you on that. Yeah. (laughs) So I want you to take me through the logistics of this. This is a private test right now. How can people get it if they think that they may have had COVID at some point? Right. So in Ontario and Quebec, you can go through Dynacare, which is like a private healthcare services lab. They do all kinds of tests that aren't covered under OHIP. And basically, I went on their website and I was matched with a doctor who called me within that day and just asked me like, why do you want the test? What are your reasons? And I told him, you know, the truth that I was a probable case and I would just like to know for my own peace of mind. So he wrote me like a requisition or kind of like a a form to get it done within that day. Like I emailed it ASAP. And then I brought it to one of the Dynacare labs in Toronto and it was super quick, efficient process. They were great there. Really quick blood test in my arm. Didn't really hurt or anything like that. And then I got my results back within 24 hours online. And they used two of the Health Canada approved um, antibody tests. There's a few that are approved now under Health Canada. And it just said, you know, that... I tested positive for the COVID-19 antibodies using these two tests. They do the first one, which is a Roche test. And then if that's positive, they confirm it again with a test from Abbott. Okay. You start off the article with the fact that when you saw the positive results, you were thrilled. Why? Yeah, I know. It does sound very strange. I guess just because I 
knew that I had it. As I said, I didn't have that piece of paper to prove it. So it was just really nice to be like validated from my own peace of mind to know that, you know, <laughs> it wasn't all in my head. Yeah. So I was actually like really happy to know that I had been exposed. And, you know, I'm better now, obviously not contagious anymore. I don't have any more symptoms. So it was just nice to know that I hadn't gone through all that for nothing, I guess. It was it was kind of a strange emotion, but definitely was happy to see that. I do want to get a bit more of the specifics about this, but you know what? I think we should probably get to this thing right now. Why are these antibodies important? And the follow-up is, are you now immune like Donald Trump? <laughs> So your body kind of produces these antibodies as part of your immune response to the virus. So they're still visible in your blood, or they might be, after you kind of successfully fought off this illness. And I should add that the tests are covered under OHIP for very specific circumstances where it would impact somebody's medical care or public health actions. Like, for example, if you have a kid who's had this kind of rare inflammatory syndrome that has shown up after COVID in some cases, but is testing negative, they would then do a test. Or if you have symptoms and you're in the hospital, but you've had like two negative tests, I think, then that would be covered. So very limited circumstances covered under OHIP. And then for everybody else, you kind of pay out of pocket. For myself, it was just for peace of mind. And that's kind of what all the experts told me. They were like, great, if you want to get it for curiosity, but definitely don't act like you're immune just because you have the antibodies, because there actually have been a handful of cases of documented reinfection. There was a man in Hong Kong, I think during the summer, that was screened at an airport coming back from a vacation, I think, and he was tested positive again, and they sequenced the virus and found that it was like a different strain than the one that he was infected with the first time around. Also, it just came out a couple days ago in The Lancet, a case about a man in Nevada who got it a second time around. Again, they sequenced the virus to see that it was a different strain the second time and actually had a worse case the second time than the first time around. But antibodies basically that are in your bloodstream show that you've had the virus and basically fought it off, but they don't actually kill the virus, right? So it's kind of showing you that you had it, but I guess the question of like whether or not you're immune is like, they're still collecting data on that. They just don't have enough information yet because the virus is only like 10 months old to be able to tell you that you're like protected. They can't really say that that makes you immune right now, basically. And also like, I don't know the level of my antibodies, like how strong they are. Generally, for other diseases, like they would fade after a while. We don't know how long and we don't know like how much they have to drop in order to not protect you anymore. So all those questions are being worked on by researchers who are cranking out studies about this and also paying attention to these few cases of reinfection, which kind of only tell you that it is possible to be reinfected. It doesn't tell you whether it's likely or like whether you would have a milder case or a worse case. So definitely Trump shouldn't be saying that he's immune because that's not like the consensus among experts at this point and definitely shouldn't be, as he says, like going out and planning on kissing people or acting like he has some kind of superpower because that's definitely not responsible. But it's just more misinformation from him, which we can expect at this point. Oh, wait, you're telling me you didn't walk out of the clinic with a supergirl costume? No. <laughs> <Kidding. I> wish. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned it before. What are the limitations of these tests so far? And I believe that there's some in the U.S. that actually do tell you how strong they're on your bloodstream, but I think here it's just yes or no. Is that right? Yeah. So the one that I got was just yes or no. And one of the experts I spoke to told me that there are some available in the U.S. and the U.K. that do tell you things like how strong they are. There's also some faster tests available, but there are some issues with the accuracy of some of those tests. But the ones in Canada that are approved by Health Canada have very high accuracy rates, but they only tell you like yes or no, you have them. And it's also only a snapshot, right? So I could have them now, but then they could fade by next month. Like, I don't know if it's kind of up in the air. We'll be right back. This disease is so new. The fact that you have it at seven months is interesting because you're probably sort of on the leading edge there. I believe there was just a U of T study that said it was 100 days. 
right? So what do we know about this timing and why is it important? Yeah. So there was a team in Toronto at U of T and also at Mount Sinai that were looking over a few months at what happens to the antibody in the blood and also the saliva. They found that, yeah, they were sticking around for over 100 days, so like a few months, which is really encouraging. There's also a study from researchers in Massachusetts that was also published in the same journal last week that kind of confirmed that finding or also found that. Yeah, so the idea now is maybe that they can last a few months. I'm seven months out. Obviously, like my one case doesn't really mean anything. They're just going to have to see with more time and following patients and following potential cases of reinfection to kind of monitor all of them and see what happens. And I know that the Toronto team is doing that, continuing to take samples from people and, and really trying to get the next piece of this puzzle for sure to see like when the antibodies drop at what level like people you know stop being protected if people are reinfected if it's worse if it's milder the second time around you do this for peace of mind there are other people out there and i know that you've talked to some of them where it's not for peace of mind they have lingering symptoms and yet some of them aren't positive on this test. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I think I've talked to, you know, some people who are suffering continuing symptoms. Sometimes they're called long haulers. And then they believe they had COVID a few months ago and they're still suffering like every day with debilitating symptoms. And I think for them, it's more than just peace of mind. Some of them are still unable to work and they didn't get the test back in the spring because like me, they didn't qualify. So for them to have a piece of paper is really significant, I think. And some of them, you know, are trying to get short-term disability and things like that, or extend leave off work and having a, a positive antibody test kind of bolsters that case. But not everyone, you know, is going to test positive seven months later. I think there are people who test negative and the immune system is super complicated. I was just kind of taking a a first to kind of look into it with this article. And there's also like T-cell immunity, which is a little bit less straightforward to test for. So antibodies are kind of just one aspect of it. And we're hearing a lot about it because it's easier to test for and more straightforward to test for. Now, here's the thing, you know, you're feeling better, you have these antibodies, but what does that actually change for you? I mean, you still have to take pretty much all the precautions, right? Uh, yeah. So Every doctor I've talked to, whether it's Toronto Public Health or experts for this story or the doctor who ordered the test for me has said, you still have to take all the precautions. We don't have enough information on what this means. And the danger is that if you go out and start acting like you're immune, that maybe you could get reinfected. Maybe you could infect others. So basically it doesn't change anything, which is the reason why I think doctors are, you know, sometimes hesitant to recommend these tests for people is because like it doesn't change your behavior and it shouldn't change your behavior. Definitely it shouldn't change Trump's behavior at all, but we'll see. Seems like he believes that it should. You talked a little bit about reinfection. What do we know about that right now? So there have been a handful of cases of documented reinfection. So not just like media reports or people saying that they've been reinfected, but like published studies by researchers who've looked at people who were infected twice and who have looked at the strain of the virus that they have and can see that it's a different strain the second time around. And it's hard to know like what to make of those cases. One researcher that I talked to from U of T just said, it just means that it's possible to get reinfected. We don't know how likely it is. There was a paper published a couple of days ago about a man in Nevada who got reinfected and it seems that it was the worst case the second time around, which is scary because typically you would expect if people were reinfected that it would be milder. But again, that's like one case out of how many now, right? So they just kind of need to see what happens as the months tick on and what happens to people who already had it and how many people are getting reinfected and what the illness is like for them if they are reinfected. I talked to you again for one of our early episodes when your case was probable. And this is one of the reasons that I absolutely love this article because it closed the loop and I love the kicker in particular because, I mean, after this went out, the coronavirus conspiracy types were on my feed trolling me. I can only imagine what it was like for you. Can you describe a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I definitely had like super positive response to the article the first time around. And that was really nice, but definitely had some coronavirus conspiracy trolls. I don't know whether they were Russian bots. Probably some of them are real people, but they were just saying like you had the flu and this is not real and you didn't even get a test and blah, 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 blah. So yeah, it is nice to be able to close the loop and to have, you know, as I said, a piece of paper that kind of confirms it. But I honestly don't think there's any arguing with those deep <laughs> conspiracy trolls at this point. So probably won't make a difference to them, unfortunately. If perhaps we could convince them, what would you want to say to them to try and take this more seriously? 
You know, I would say it's totally normal to want to ask questions and to be skeptical and to want to have information. And, you know, for a lot of my family and friends, I was the only person that they knew who actually got COVID in the spring. And that's because we did such a great job at shutting down the first time around and everyone stayed home and workplaces shut and the chain of transmission for a lot of people was just like stopped. So people didn't experience it at that personal level of like, oh, a friend or a family member has it. So I understand maybe why you can start to think like, hey, what's the big deal about this if I'm not seeing anyone in my own life who has it or I don't have it. But that's because, you know, we did a good job in the spring. Doesn't mean that it's not real. And if you seek out all the information, you'll see how serious this is, you know, how many people have died, how many people have gotten really sick, how many people are still struggling with symptoms, debilitating symptoms on a day-to-day basis. So yeah, I would just say you'll find that information out there. And if you don't want to believe it, you don't want to believe in science, then good luck to you. And I really hope that you don't accidentally kill off any of your family members because it could happen. Can we just do a recap of your symptoms and how long you felt bad afterward? Yes. My first symptom was fatigue. And then that got like really bad fatigue. I also had like weird pain in my like abdomen, chest area for a little while loss of appetite, dry cough. Then I was kind of like in bed for like a few days, like not able to do anything, shortness of breath, exhausted from having a shower. I just kind of felt like a bit winded all the time. I wasn't gasping, but I was um, like really exhausted from like having a shower or like checking my Twitter or something like easy like that. And then at the end, I just started coughing up like bloody mucus, which was really gross for a few days. But then I started getting better. So all in all, I would say it was like, maybe a week and a half, 10 days of like being totally out. And after that, you know, kind of slowly started to get better, had some headaches, but better after that definitely was not like immediately bouncing back right after two weeks. Like it still took me a while to get back to like my normal exercise routine and like running and things like that. One, I'm so glad that you recovered. Thanks. (laughs) I'm very, very happy that you've come (laughs) and explained this because obviously I think With testing, there's a lot of people, I've heard this from people say, oh, I think I had it in February. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think I've already had it. Do you think that there's a mentality out there like that maybe that's one reason some people are taking it so seriously? They think they've already had it because they had a cold back then? Maybe. Honestly, I think probably not. I think there are people who are curious, but those are kind of maybe the people who have been reading more about it and were reading more about it earlier and are already kind of taking it seriously. So I guess the danger with these antibody tests is just that you take it and you think that you're immune, which is, you know, you shouldn't assume that. But yeah, they are available if you kind of just want that peace of mind to kind of know what happened to your own body for sure. That's out there if you want to pay for it. I would just, I should say mine cost $70 from Dynacare. So that's definitely not accessible to everyone, but it also wasn't like a crazy exorbitant price. May, thank you so much for spending the time with us again. Appreciate it. May Warren is a star reporter in our health and science unit. That's it for today. Thanks so much for joining us. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Raji Budder, Adrian Chung, and Saba Etisaz. Produced and mixed by Sean Pattenden, and our director of programming is J.P. Fozo. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. Thank you.